Welcome to lesson 15H, Fano Flow, Compressible Duct Flow with Friction. In this lesson, we introduce Fano Flow, which is flow in a duct with friction, but without heat transfer. We'll discuss it both qualitatively and quantitatively, and I'll do an example problem. I do a more rigorous analysis in my compressible flow course. By way of introduction, here are the approximations and assumptions we make. The flow is steady, one-dimensional. We have a long, straight section of duct, and at any x location, the average speed is v, but it's a function of x, where x is the downstream direction. So at some other location, v can change. Here it's accelerating. This 1D approximation ignores boundary layers, but we know that if we magnify this section, these are typically high Reynolds number flows that are turbulent and the boundary layer is thin. But since we're dealing with friction, we know that the wall must supply a shear stress, tau w, acting on the fluid by the wall. We also assume ideal gas, constant gas properties, constant area, fully developed. In other words, ignore any entrance effects. These will be very long pipes or ducts. And we assume negligible heat transfer. In other words, adiabatic flow. Let's do a quick qualitative comparison with Rayleigh flow, which I discussed in a previous lesson. We usually deal with very short ducts in Rayleigh flow, but long ducts in Fano flow. In Rayleigh flow, we neglect friction, but in Fano flow, friction is very important. Heat transfer is kind of opposite. In Rayleigh flow, heat transfer is important, but in Fano flow, we neglect heat transfer. As we did with Rayleigh flow, let's do a control volume analysis for Fano flow. Here's a section of our duct. We'll start at location 1 or x1 and go downstream to x2, location 2. We pick a control volume that is just inside the wall of the duct and slices across 1 and 2. We'll let A be the cross-sectional area of the duct. Now we apply our conservation equations. Since it's a constant area duct, Conservation of mass is rho 1 v1 equal rho 2 v2. This is the same as with Rayleigh flow, and we'll call this equation 1. Conservation of energy is also the same as with Rayleigh flow, where we had q, defined as q dot over m dot, the mass flow rate, equals cp t naught 2 minus t naught 1. But this flow is adiabatic, so the left-hand side is 0, which tells us that t naught 1 has to equal t naught 2. This is a simplification of Rayleigh flow in that there's no heat transfer. Let's combine the mass and energy equations 1 and 2, the ideal gas law, TDS equation, and some state equations for compressible flow that we learned previously, and generate the Fano curve or Fano line. This is similar to what we did with Rayleigh flow, namely we plot on a TS diagram. The Fano curve looks something like this, where like the Rayleigh curve, we have a subsonic branch and a supersonic branch. We also see a maximum specific entropy point, which we'll also call S star, where these two branches intersect. A key to understanding Fano flow, since there's no heat transfer, and since friction is an irreversibility, specific entropy must always go up. In other words, we can move to the right only on our plot. If location 1 is in the subsonic branch, as we go down the pipe when there's friction, we must go to the right, increasing s, eventually reaching sonic conditions, or star conditions, or critical conditions, where the Mach number is 1. I say moving down the pipe, or the duct. You can also imagine a situation where you have more roughness in the pipe, and therefore friction factor increases. Either way, you can only move to the right. Similarly, if we start with supersonic flow, again we must move to the right, increasing s, until we reach Mach number 1. For the subsonic case, Mach number increases, and for the supersonic case, Mach number decreases. In either case, Mach number approaches 1, which we call sonic or critical conditions, with a star superscript for either subsonic or supersonic flow. But now it's friction that's driving this flow, rather than heat transfer. I'll make some comments. The Fano curve is similar to the Rayleigh curve, but the Rayleigh curve satisfies mass and momentum, but the Fano curve satisfies the mass and energy equations. So we can say that the energy equation determines where we land on the Rayleigh curve, but the momentum equation determines where we land on the Fano curve. On the Fano curve, we start at 1, and the amount of friction or the length of the pipe determines where we land on this curve. We also notice 
that there's a strange zone just like we had with Rayleigh flow. But here, in Fano flow, the strange zone is the entire subsonic region. What I mean by the strange zone is that as friction increases, temperature goes down, as we see here in the subsonic branch. But, sir, doesn't friction cause heat? Well, more precisely, Ned, viscous dissipation increases the internal energy of the gas, which is usually felt as an increase in temperature, yes. But here, the gas expands. It turns out that density, pressure, and temperature all go down. My brain can't handle this. Ned, are you okay? I think so. Sorry, Ned, you'll have to take my compressible flow course to fully understand all this. Okay, sir. Now let's look at the linear momentum equation in the x-direction, which we haven't discussed yet for Fano flow. There's no gravity in the x-direction. There's no struts or other forces acting on the control volume. But there are pressure forces, which reduce to P1A minus P2A, same as Rayleigh flow. And we do have a viscous force this time, which is in the negative x-direction, which is negative F friction acting to the left, trying to slow the gas down. On the right, beta is approximately 1 at both outlet and inlet. So at the outlet, or location 2, we have 1 times rho 2, v2, a2, which is the mass flow rate, times another v2. And with a similar term for the inlet, with subscripts 1 instead, we can drop the 2 and the 1 subscript on a, since it's a constant area duct. We divide by a and rearrange, and we get p1 plus rho 1 v1 squared equal P2 plus rho 2 V2 squared plus F friction divided by A. This is our linear momentum equation, which we'll call equation 3. There are other equations we can use in our toolbox. For example, the TDS equations for an ideal gas, one of which is S2 minus S1 equals Cp natural log of T2 over T1 minus R natural log of P2 over P1. The ideal gas law, which we can write as P1 over rho 1 T1 equal P2 over rho 2 T2. And we have state equations for compressible flow, such as T0 over T equal 1 plus K minus 1 over 2 Mach number squared. This state equation is valid anywhere at 1 or 2 or star or any other location, since it's a state equation, etc. I show here a summary of all the equations for Fano flow for an ideal gas. Here's our mass equation, our energy equation, and our momentum equation. We need to do something about this friction force, however. How do we calculate it? Well, let's take a round section of pipe, for example. The shear stress along the wall is tau w, and this acts all around the circumference or perimeter of the pipe. So if we go from location 1 to 2, we integrate such that F friction over the area is the perimeter, or circumference, here, over A, times the integral from x1 to x2 of shear stress tau w dx. Now we recall from previous lessons the Darcy friction factor, F, which is kind of a non-dimensional form of tau w, and we assume F is constant between x1 and x2. We have an equation for F, namely the Churchill equation, which is given here in terms of hydraulic diameter, since the duct does not have to be round. Plugging all these in, we get this integral for F friction over A. Now we plug all these into equation 3, our momentum equation, and do a lot of algebra to end up with this equation. This is valid for any location x2 when we have given initial location x1, and we evaluate this from ma1 to ma2 from our integration. But let's consider the choked case, where Mach number 2 is 1, and we'll let x2 minus x1 be L star 1, star again indicating choked flow at the exit. After a little more algebra, this equation reduces to this, which we'll call equation 4. L star 1 is the critical length from x1 to the location where the flow becomes sonic. In other words, how long the duct has to be to choke the flow. So this is the equation we get for choked flow. Now let's apply equation 4 to Fano flow problems. We assume that we have known conditions at 1, V1, P1, T1, MA1, etc. Let's let this section of pipe from 1 or X1 to the pipe exit be the actual pipe. So as we go downstream in X, 2 would be the actual location of the pipe exit. 
But now let's imagine an extension, which isn't physical, but imaginary. And we go far enough downstream in this pipe or duct that we reach critical or sonic conditions. In other words, where the flow is choked. The distance from X1 to the end of this imaginary extension is what we're calling L star 1. Let's define all these L's. L is the actual duct length from 1 to 2, where 2 is the actual duct exit plane. L star at 1 is the imaginary duct length from 1 to star, this entire length, part of which is real and part of which is an imaginary extension. We can also define an L star 2, which is the imaginary duct length from 2 to star. In other words, if we start here along our imaginary extension, we require length L star 2 to get to the choked location. You can easily see from our dimensions here that L plus L star 2 is equal to L star 1, or L equal L star 1 minus L star 2. Now because we have F L star over DH in our equation 4, we multiply by F over DH. So we have F L over DH equal F L star 1 over DH minus F L star 2 over DH. Where remember that we're assuming F is constant throughout the duct and hydraulic diameter is also constant. Finally, we rewrite equation 4 at any X and any Mach number. This leads us to the workhorse equations for Fano flow, which I summarize here. The equation for FL over DH we just derived, and equation 4 at any Mach number. Now we're ready to solve Fano flow problems. Here's the procedure, which I'll go over very quickly, and then do an example problem. We start with known conditions at 1, duct roughness epsilon, hydraulic diameter DH, and pipe length L, from which we can calculate the friction factor from the Churchill equation. Once we have F, we use our workhorse equation to calculate F L star 1 over DH, and then our other workhorse equation, and this time we'll solve for F L star 2 over DH. Once we know that, we can calculate Mach number 2 using our workhorse equation again. This is the hardest part, since this is an implicit equation for Mach number 2. Once we have MA2, we can calculate temperature T2 using these ratios and our state equations. Finally, step 6, once we know T2 and MA2, we can calculate any other desired properties at 2. This is best illustrated by an example. Air enters a 5 centimeter diameter, 27 meter long tube. This is D, which is also DH for a round duct and this is L. We're also given T1, P1, and V1. We are also given epsilon, the pipe roughness. We assume the flow is well insulated or adiabatic, but we do have friction since this is a long pipe, 27 meters long. So this is the ideal conditions for Fano flow. We're asked to estimate the temperature, pressure, velocity, and Mach number at location 2. Velocity, of course, is in the x direction, so we really are after the speed, V2. To solve this problem, we repeat the approximations and assumptions that we made previously, and then I summarize the inlet conditions. The known values are the speed, temperature, and pressure at location 1, along with the hydraulic diameter, the roughness, and the length. Calculated values at the inlet are Mach number 1, the viscosity using the Sutherland equation, and the density at 1 from the ideal gas law. Now let's follow our step-by-step -step procedure. We have enough information to calculate the Reynolds number, and therefore F from the Churchill equation. I get these two values. Step two is to calculate F L star 1 over DH from our workhorse equation. We plug in Mach number 1 as 0 0.200. I get 14.550. Step three is to use this value here to solve for F L star 2 over DH. Let's rewrite this equation and plug in the numbers. We use this value for this term, 14.550. We plug in F, 0.02296 from here. Length L was given, and our hydraulic diameter is the same as D, the diameter of the pipe for a round pipe. Thus we get F L star 2 over DH is 2.1507. In step 4, we take this value, plug it into our workhorse equation at location 2, and we solve implicitly for MA2. This involves some iteration, and I use the false position method. I get 0.40902. Step 5 is to calculate T2. Now that we know Mach number 2, and we also know Mach number 1, T1 itself is also given as 450K. 
we get T2 equal 438.91K. Finally, step six is to calculate the other properties at location two. I'll do some quick examples. The speed of sound at location two is the square root of K, which is the K for air, R for air, and T2, which we just calculated. I get 419.94 meters per second. Now we can get V2, since we know both C2 and MA2, which gives me 171.76 meters per second. We can calculate density from the conservation of mass equation, since rho 1 V1 is rho 2 V2, where we get P2 from the ideal gas law. From these, I get P2 is 106.19 kPa. The final answers for all the properties that we were asked for to three significant digits are T2, P2, V2, and MA2. Notice that as we said, since this is the subsonic branch, temperature has gone down. T1 was 450. Pressure has also gone down. P1 was 220 kPa. V has gone up. V1 was 85 meters per second. And Mach number has gone up. The original Mach number was 0.2. This agrees with our phantom curve since we're on the subsonic branch. We've gone from 1 to 2 along the subsonic branch. Finally, let's do an additional verification. Namely, let's see if the Darcy friction factor remains nearly constant. Here's our Moody chart, and let's compare the Reynolds numbers and the friction factors. We've already calculated RE1, so at that Reynolds number, and the non-dimensional roughness ratio of 0.0016, we got F1 equal 0 0.02296. This Reynolds number is about here on the Moody chart, and this roughness is somewhere around here, which gives us our F1, where I have to sketch in a curve for this roughness value of 0 0.0016. If we repeat this at conditions 2, I get RE2 is 3,00706 for the same roughness, and the Churchill equation gives us 0 0.002293. So the approximation that F is constant is a very good approximation. RE2 is very close to RE1, in fact, and F hardly changes at all. For very high-speed flows, these curves on the Moody chart flatten out, so even if Reynolds number were to increase significantly, F does not change much at all. In conclusion, we validated this approximation. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos. One, two, three. That's all there is to it.